Many investors now screen companies for their environmental, social, and governance standards. That should be a good thing, but then why are they still investing in China? Welcome to China Uncensored. I'm Chris Chappell. For many foreign investors, China is the land of opportunity, the El Dorado of capital markets. When China was coming out of the Cultural Revolution, it couldn't make a lot of things itself, or at least not well. This created an opportunity for foreign businesses to come in, and they sure did. China has 1.4 billion people, which means that even just a fraction of them buy a company's product, that company can get filthy rich. This is why foreign investment in China just keeps getting bigger. But there are some big ethical red flags when it comes to investing in China. To start, China has a major pollution problem. In a push to make Chinese Communist Party officials rich, I mean, develop the economy, China's basically trashed the environment. That's thanks in large part to its use of coal, which has badly polluted Chinese cities. China has other pollution problems as well, which I won't go into here, but I'll put a link to this video we did about how China's pollution has reached apocalyptic levels. Thanks in large part to China's coal consumption, China emits more CO2 than all other developed countries combined, which as you can imagine made China pretty unpopular at the COP27 climate summit this summer. China's pollution problem has also led to the phenomenon of cancer villages where almost every household in a village has at least one person suffering from cancer. Not to be outdone by its environmental record, though. China's human rights record is equally bad. Maybe worse. Although it's kind of like comparing apples and oranges. Terrible apples and horrible oranges. The nonprofit Freedom House gave China a 9 out of 100 for freedom this year. Meanwhile, Reporters Without Borders gave China one of the lowest rankings in the world for press freedom. As in, there are only five countries that are worse, including Iran and North Korea. And the U.S. State Department has designated China a country of particular concern for violating religious freedom. The U.S. has also accused China of committing genocide against the Uyghurs, a mostly Muslim ethnic minority. That includes locking up at least one million Uyghurs in concentration camps. Even the UN, which has been deeply compromised by China, says this potentially constitutes a crime against humanity. In 2019, an independent tribunal in the UK found that China forcibly harvests organs from prisoners of conscience. And if anyone dares criticize the Chinese Communist Party, they can legally be disappeared and tortured. I could go on, but I think you get the idea. Then there's China's censorship, which is what keeps the lid on the pressure cooker despite all these problems. Besides creating a great firewall that blocks outside information from China's internet, China has created a surveillance system that uses AI to track people by their appearance, their cars, and their phones. China requires its citizens to use their real names on the internet so they can easily be tracked down if they run afoul of censors. And China even requires people to do a face scan to get a new phone. Which is bad, but not as bad as having to do a face scan just to get some toilet paper. Clearly, that's the real outrage here. While the Chinese Communist Party was busy building George Orwell's dystopian society from 1984, the investment world came to their senses and stopped investing in China. At least, that's how the story should have gone. Unfortunately, the exact opposite happened. I'll tell you more after the break. Welcome back. There's a newish trend in the investment world called ESG, which stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance Investing. The idea is that investment decides which companies succeed and which fail. And what better way to improve the world than investing in companies that support good values? Sounds like a good thing, right? The problem is, money is always a bigger priority and ESG standards can be easily manipulated. The idea of ESG, or socially responsible investing, has been around since at least the 1970s, but it really took off in the last 10 years or so. This chart 
shows the number of signatories on the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, or PRI. PRI is basically the UN's take on ESG principles. In its definition of PRI, the UN lists things like climate change, pollution, human rights, modern slavery, bribery and corruption, and political lobbying. Now here, it looks like environmental, social, and governance issues are all given equal weight. But in reality, the focus of most ESG investments is on the environment. And of those environmental issues I listed earlier, climate change is by far the main issue. Even the UN admits that climate change is the highest priority ESG issue facing investors. So since China is basically a walking climate disaster, and even plans to build more coal power plants than it already has, you might think ESG investors would realize China isn't a green investment. But no, like I said earlier, when it comes to making money, what really matters is this kind of green. Here's how the World Economic Forum justifies this double think. President Xi has announced China's goal to be carbon neutral by 2060, which will further fuel the transition to low carbon economy transition. Never mind that China has also said it will continue increasing its CO2 emissions through 2030. Others claim China is definitely committed to going green because it's the biggest manufacturer of renewables equipment. Yes, all the solar panels are being made with forced labor in China. So green. Now I'm sure some of you are thinking, why so cynical, Chris? Just because China oppresses its people and pollutes the environment doesn't mean it doesn't care about the destruction of the planet. Well, for one, the fact that China emits more greenhouse gases than the entire developed world combined and doesn't plan to stop for another eight years makes it pretty clear what its priorities are. Second, if you look at how China treats other global resources the world depends on, you can see that China basically doesn't care. For example, China has essentially wiped out all the fish in its own waters, which is why Chinese fishermen have been caught poaching all around the world. And it's not just private fishermen doing this, these are state-subsidized fishing operations. When the Chinese Communist Party talks about the promise of renewable energy, it's not saying that because it cares about climate change. It says that because it's a great business opportunity. For example, China gave massive subsidies to its solar panel industry. This allowed it to flood the market with cheap solar panels and drive out competition all around the world. And like I mentioned earlier, I'm sure it also helped that China has a lot of enslaved Uyghurs that needed to be re-educated through forced labor. Then there's the Chinese Communist Party's history of saying what investors want to hear and then doing the exact opposite. This is the vice chair of China's Securities Regulatory Commission in August 2020. The, uh, the Chinese economy um, you know, despite the challenge of right, COVID-19, uh, has actually recovered quite nicely. And uh, uh, I, during the last three weeks or so, I went to Hainan, <laughs> I went to Qingdao, and I went to Shenzhen, and then I went to uh, Guangzhou. So I went to four uh, cities during the last three weeks. And just based on my own observation, you know, the economy seems to have uh, quite fully recovered. This was during a time when China was trying to convince the world it had basically beaten COVID. Well, two years later, China is still in the throes of the pandemic and its economy has definitely not recovered. Which is why it's now trying to boost foreign investment. I'll tell you more after the break. Welcome back. So China has been trying to woo foreign investors to help its sagging economy. And foreign investors have responded despite the risk that arbitrary government shutdowns could come back at any time. Even earlier in the pandemic, companies were still heavily invested in China. In 2021, Hong Kong Watch looked at a range of institutional investors that had investments in China, many of them managers of public funds. All of them used ESG language to describe their investment principles. But when you look at the companies they invested in, Let's just say they had a pretty loose interpretation of ESG. The New Zealand Superannuation Fund is New Zealand's government-owned investment fund that covers pretty much every New Zealander's pension funds. It claims it's committed to the UN's principles for responsible investing. It even received an A-plus rating from the UN's PRI for its responsible investments. 
But Hong Kong Watch found it was invested in 14 Chinese companies that the U.S. had blacklisted over national security and human rights concerns. iFly Tech, for example, has reportedly worked with China's military. Well, Zhejiang Dahua Technology worked with the Chinese regime on surveillance systems to track Uyghurs. Same thing with the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, Norway's government-run pension fund. It claims it expects companies to integrate human rights into their business practices, and says companies can be excluded from the fund if they don't. Yet Hong Kong Watch found that the fund was heavily invested in companies like Alibaba, Tencent, and Baidu. Alibaba has worked with the Chinese government on facial recognition technology that specifically targeted Uyghurs. Tencent, which owns messaging service WeChat, routinely censors for the Chinese Communist Party, even surveilling foreign users of WeChat. Search engine Baidu has also been accused of working with the party on censoring pro-democracy speech. Last month, financial services firm Morningstar downgraded the ESG rating for Tencent and Baidu over their censorship of the Chinese internet. So that's all pretty bad. And then there are the foreign funds invested in China's state-owned energy companies. The UK Parliamentary Contributory Pension Fund is the pension scheme for British members of parliament. In addition to being invested in Tencent and Alibaba, it has hundreds of thousands of pounds invested in Sinopec. Sinopec is owned by the state enterprise Sinopec Group. Sinopec has close links with the Chinese military and state, developing body armor for the Chinese military as well as being the largest oil and gas refining company in the world. Now, according to a 2021 report the pension fund put out, the stewards of the fund are supposed to screen for human rights violations as well as climate change risks. I'm not sure how they see being invested in the largest producer of oil and natural gas as helping mitigate climate change, but I'm sure they have a good excuse. The UK University's superannuation scheme was also invested in Sinopec. This is the largest private pension scheme in the UK and is also a member of the UN's PRI. Now, these aren't the only institutional funds invested in China. Many others, like J.P. Morgan Chase and BlackRock, are also heavily invested there. But just because it's common doesn't make it okay. Companies that claim to follow ESG principles are making the term almost meaningless by investing in China. And not just because of the Chinese Communist Party's human rights and environmental violations. It's also because the Communist Party's system of civil-military fusion means that all companies in China, whether they're private or state-owned, are ultimately under the control of the state. And that state doesn't exactly care about improving environmental, social, or governance-related issues. And remember, China Uncensored is able to keep making episodes like this because of viewers like you who contribute to the show through the crowdfunding website Patreon. As a thank you, I answer their questions at the end of the episode. Today's question comes from generic full-time weirdo. Recently, I saw a map of countries that claims to be a democracy. China was one of the nearly 95% of those countries. Could you explain what democracy with Chinese characteristics looks like inside a country with a Marxist-Leninist ideology? Well, generic full-time weirdo, I can do better than that. I made an entire episode last year on how China is a democracy now. Or rather, on how the Chinese Communist Party is doing this huge propaganda campaign to co-opt the term democracy. Yes, the Chinese Communist Party has a way better democracy than the stupid United States with their stupid mass voting. The best type of democracy is one person, one vote. And that person is Xi Jinping. How does China's so-called democracy fit in with Marxism-Leninism? Perfectly. It's even in China's constitution. You see, it's the Chinese Communist Party, under the guidance of Marxism-Leninism, that's leading the People's Democratic Dictatorship. And if you're confused about what the People's Democratic Dictatorship means, I explained how Chairman Mao invented that term and how it's even more messed up than it sounds in this episode. Check it out, generic full-time weirdo, and thank you for supporting the show. And if you'd like to do the same, visit patreon.com slash China Uncensored. We rely on your support to keep making great episodes. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. Thanks for watching China Uncensored.